Hello everyone, I think uh, we can uh, start. Aaron, the floor is yours to present uh, the speakers. Morning everyone, thanks. Thank you very much for attending. Um, we appreciate you participating in this and um, I'd like to um, uh, Yeah, first introduce uh, Julia to uh, to speak. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, new training series uh, of uh, the National Open Access uh, uh, Monitor for uh, Irish. Uh, today, um, we will uh, uh, present uh, the um, this uh, training is about uh, denouncing uh, the transparency for uh, your uh, uh, um, article processing charges and book processing charges. And I would like uh, uh, to leave the floor to Leonidas to explain the link uh, between uh, uh, the, the services. Okay. Hello to everybody. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar on uh, uh, enhancing the open access transparency from uh, APC data to insights in the Irish Open Access Monitor. Uh, I will say a few words regarding the article processing charges and then the importance on the, on the indicators of the, uh, monitoring APCs in generally in monitor, in uh, research assessment, and of course in the Irish Open Access Monitor. As we all know, APCs provide insights into the costs associated with making research freely accessible, a thing that is uh, increasingly mandated nowadays by many organizations, by many funding bodies, bodies and institutions. APC's metrics are very important for uh, research funding and research performing organizations in order to understand the financial dynamics of open access publishing and its effects, not only to the organizations themselves, but broader, also to the Irish and to the entire scholarly landscape. APC's metrics also highlight their impact on the RPOs and the RFOs respective budgets, budgets, such as the shift from subscription-based models to open access models and its effects on access to research and publication practices. For, RF for RFOs, it is important that the understanding APCs allows them to budget effectively and allocate funds in order to support their researchers' compliance with the open access mandates. For RPOs, APCs shed light on the financial implications of publishing strategies, helping assisting them, their teams to make informed decisions about support of open access, and also uh, assisting them to uh, negotiations with their publishers. Additionally, monitoring APCs can reveal trends and disparities in funding allocation across different disciplines. This understanding can of course guide the policy development and the resource distribution among the institutions, ensuring equitable support for researchers across all fields. And uh, before I give the floor for further presentations to OpenAPC, I would like to say that uh, currently in uh, the Iris uh, Open Access Monitor, we present the APCs in two levels. First of all, we have the APCs that has been uh, reported by the institution alongside the ones uh, that come from publications that uh, future co future co-authors affiliated with other institutions. Therefore, these publications, uh, the, these APCs are not funded by the respective RPO or RFO. And of course, we have the APCs that uh, are solely reported by the institution in Open APC, which are the ones funded by the respective organization. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lena. That's, uh, and now I'll ask uh, Annika Lind from IRL to uh, give uh, an oh, overview. I think it's one before me, uh, Julia. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Apologies, Julia. <laughs> 
That's all right. So um, thank you for the introduction, Leonidas, and also Aaron. So first of all, I would like to share my screen with you. So can you see my presentation also in the presentation mode? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So uh, first of all, a uh, warm welcome for me as well. I'm uh, delighted to uh, introduce OpenIPC to you a little bit. And that is wait, our agenda for today. So first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about OpenAPC in general, including our aims and principles. And then a longer segment will um, then cover uh, the process of data submissions. And finally, I will present some uh, concrete features and benefits that OpenAPC offers to participating institutions. So I'm starting with a little overview. OpenAPC is an, is an open data project, which was established at Bielefeld University Library back in 2014. We collect and disseminate data sets on fees paid for open access publishing under an open database license. So what we do is uh, we aggregate cost data on open access publishing. We aggregate APC, so article processing charges for journal articles, we aggregate since 2016 uh, data on transformative agreements. And since 2020, we also started on aggregating BPC, so book processing charges, the charges paid for open access books. Um, for the three different types, Open APC operates three different data sets. And open access charges for other publication types like single book chapters or conference proceedings are not collected at the moment. So this slide presents some current facts and numbers. We always uh, like to present them at occasions like this because you know they always go up. So our APD, APC data set is uh, the largest one. It consists of uh, 220. 1,872 articles, which are provided by over 400 institutions. And if you go ahead and sum up all the um, APCs in this data set, you get a total sum of over 450 million euros. So um, a lot of um, money there in open access publishing. The BPC data set is uh, somewhat different in terms of numbers. Here we have received data on over 1,800 books from 61 institutions with an aggregated sum of over 12 million euros. And then a short overview of our so-called TA data set, which provides information on publications within transformative agreements we, here we have data on over 100,000 articles submitted by 382 institutions um, within 118 different agreements. So this graphic shows the evolution of our APC data set over time. And as you can see here very well, the numbers of records has increased continuously over the years. So what are our aims and principles in OpenAPC? <clears throat> our aims in general are to establish cost transparency and also comparability, because as Leonidas uh, already mentioned, if you want to do policies and make decisions within the open access transition framework, you need uh, good data and numbers. And an important step to achieve this is by enabling transparent and also reproducible reporting for institutions and funders. Moreover, OpenAPC also wants to help uh, to track development of costs over time. So now to our principles, our most important principle, I would say is to apply a maximum of transparency to all that we do. So uh, the open in OpenAPC does not only apply to the data itself, but it also applies to, 
for example, all our code and the scripts we write to our workflows we apply and also to the um, project history itself. We actually use Git and GitHub to achieve this. So we um, do have a repository on GitHub and this also serves as the main data storage for us. Moreover, we uh, imply a high degree of automation and this is also yeah, basically a um, necessity, I would say. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to cope with a high degree of um, ingestion. What, just, what this means, um, the automation, I will show you in a minute. So um, next, I would like to talk a bit about um, the, so to say, inner workings of Open APC, about our workflows and routines. As all of our data is contributed um, on a, a voluntary basis by institutions, and some of you might be hopefully possible candidates from submitting data to us as well. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, the submission process. And I, I think you will see that it is really fairly easy because that's also one of our goals today to make um, yeah, the data submission process as easy as possible for participants. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Back. So, um, um, so what does it mean? The data should be provided in a machine readable format, preferably as CSV files. The submitted file should be in accordance with specific data schemas to ensure that it contains all relevant information we need. I will show them to you later on. Um, I would here highlight um, our data submission handout over here, which is linked also here. It's in our GitHub repository. And it basically wraps up everything you need to know when you are considering um, contributing data to OpenAPC. So I won't go into too much detail here regarding the handout. I think you can um, read it for yourself later if you're interesting. Um, I think the next question would be, how do you uh, send the data to us or how do you submit? Um, I think the most common way uh, is to just send an email to our um, project email address. And I think basically over 95, 98% of our participants just send us an email with a CSV sheet. What can, you can also do is you can uh, go to GitHub. And if you do have a GitHub account, you can make like a pull request there. So you can integrate your files directly into the repository. Um, that's a bit of a more advanced way, but it's not really necessary. So sending an email is uh, with the relevant information uh, is just fine. So what is relevant? Now let's have a look at our data schemas. Um, what we can see here is our data schema uh, for journal articles. I think what is interesting is that um, it consists of 18 uh, fields, but only the uh, first five metadata fields, the orange orange ones here, uh, are actually required to report to be to be reported by all participating institutions, and all the other fields you uh, see here are enriched from external sources. For example, the blue ones we obtain from Crossref. Uh, this has actually two advantages. First one is that it improves consistency of, for example, publisher names and journal article, journal titles. And of course, um, it reduces the workload for all participants as they only have to report the first five fields. So what are these fields? So first of all, what we need is a name of your institution. Then we also need a period value which is basically uh, the year in which uh, the APC was paid for. Um, then, of course, we also need uh, the specific amount. We are preferring um, the amount in Euro, but you can also send it to us in other currencies. You can uh, convert it. And then we have a uh, field for uh, DOI. This is the main identifier to obtain all the other bibliographic metadata. 
And then finally, we also need an information on the hybrid status of the journal the article was published in. So if it was like a gold journal or a hybrid journal. And as I said, all the remaining other fields we can uh, see here, we do not have to report um, because we are enriching them with our um, routines. So, <clears throat> so the submission of BPC data works in a similar way. For this, there's uh, we have a separate metadata schema um, with 13 fields, the first five being mandatory as well. Um, and the remaining fields are, again, automatically enriched on the, our side. Again, we have the fields institution, period, euro, and DOI. The difference here in comparison to the APC data um, is the backlist OA field, uh, which basically describes um, if a publication was retros retrospectively published open access. So when we say we aggregate costs, the definition of this ter term is, of course, very important. Um, so as you saw in our uh, data schemas, there's only one field for cost, the so-called euro field. Um, what does this actually mean? So basically, what we uh, what do we want to see in this field? Um, what we do want to see is an APC paid for either a gold or hybrid or open access publication or a BPC paid for open access books. It should include various discounts that publisher may apply for a number of reasons. It should also include taxes, but exclude everything else. So for example, no submission fees, color fees, page charges, and so on. So, and then a short comment in our uh, so-called TA data set. Um, this contains metadata on uh, journal articles which, which were not paid for with APCs, but published under transformative agreements instead, as I already mentioned before. So cost and payments modalities can differ a lot. So most records in this data set do not include cost information. And as you can see, also the Euro field um, for this one is not mandatory. What is important to know is that OpenAPC includes only large data submissions provided directly by funders or consortia, like the data we kindly receive um, by the Consortium of Irish Research Libraries. So um, I have to look at the clock. So um, this has been a brief overview of the way in which uh, data can be submitted. Um, and how the data is processed. Um, just to let you know, also the enriched data is stored um, in GitHub, but that's not all we do uh, with the data. When we when you report data to us, um, so what are the benefits for you? We do a lot of data analysis and data dissemination. We operate, for example, a project block. Um, we write an article for each APC submission in which the submitted data is analyzed in more details. And here, these plots and tables um, also integrated in these posts. Then we also generate um, automatic uh, data anal analysis uh, for each submission, which can help to detect possible errors in the submitted APC data. Um, what Open APC is perhaps most famous for are our um, tree, map, tree map graphics. We operate the service where we generate these nice little uh, rectangle graphics called tree maps. And what you can do here is that you can basically click into the data so you can explore it on different, different levels and from different perspectives. So let's maybe have a look at the home page. I hope you can see now the tree maps website. Um, so from, from here, you can browse and inspect the open APC data. You can either view the data for single institutions or aggregated collections. For example, here, our data set on transformative agreements. Um, what we can see here, we have this little world map. 
And this show was basically um, all the countries from which we have received APC so far. You can see there are still blank uh, spots like South America, um, yes, Australia, and uh, Oceania is well, also Asia. Asia is um, there's still a lot to do. And if you can, you can click in here, and then you can also see going over here um, that we have no APC data from Ireland uh, in open APC so far. And um, I would really like to uh, take this opportunity to encourage you <laughs> to become part of open APC. You know, every submission counts and it really doesn't have to be like a large data set. I think we also have participants which uh, have contributed a data set of only five or six articles. And that's perfectly fine because, you know, every bit helps to add to the picture. And now let me switch back to the presentation. And see the presentation mode. Yeah. Um, so, and that was basically my brief overview of Open APC and our work here. And to wrap it up, so Open APC is fully transparent, and our cost data is not just you reused by libraries or funders, but also aggregators. Um, it is integrated in uh, Open AirGraph and Open Alex, for example. And I really hope it has become clear that uh, the submission process itself is um, fairly easy. And um, as I said, we would be really happy if you uh, consider contributing data to OpenAPC. So that's uh, for now from my side. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julia. I, and now I will um, hand you over to Annika Lind from the IRL Consortia, who will uh, give a brief overview of the Consortia experience. Let's see. Hi, I hope you can hear me now. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Julia, for that uh, presentation. Um, so let me just share my screen here before I continue. There, I hope you can see it. Um, Oh, and just a quick note, so you know that uh, so the view you saw there where I Ireland is missing, it's from the open APC with the cost APCs. Uh, you can find Ireland on the TA part of it, which is like a different part of the open APC. It's like a separate data set. Um, so there you will find some, uh, some Ireland data. Um, but I'll give you a little view into what it's been like for us to um, submit the data, but most of the part will be about how do you even get the data in the first place that you want to submit. Um, so uh, just this view first, um, as Julia was showing the different fields, like this is how it can look like when we uh, send it in, for example, so as you can see, and there are some more uh, columns missing on the right, but as you can see, we leave a lot of them blank then, and we fill out the ones that are uh, relevant only. And you can just use a normal Excel sheet and then you can just do save as, and there's an option to save it as CSV format. So it's very uh, easy with the tools you're probably already using. Um, so first of all, uh, submitting to OpenAPC, very positive experience. I just send a, the um, CSV from the Excel sheet to Julia. She lets me know if there was any problem with anything um, so that's, yeah, uh, very straightforward. <laughs> um, it's the preparing the data that's a mixed experience. It's sometimes it's easy, depends on the publishers. Sometimes it's more difficult. So the question is, of course, like, where do you get this data? And it depends a bit whether you're submitting like the paid for APCs, the APCs in the wild, or uh, TA data. Uh, but basically, for Ireland's part, uh, we only had the transformative agreements or also fully OA agreements, but we have uh, the publisher agreements uh, and all our data we are getting from publisher sources. And if you're here watching and you're an IRL member, uh, you're 
uh, the things that everything that went through IRL, we sort that out for you. So you don't have to worry about that part. Um, this does not include the science direct agreement, just so you know that that's not like fully managed by IRL. Um, so another option, just to give you some ideas, because if you're uh, setting this up yourself, uh, another option would be to have your OA approvers, uh, whenever they approve something, uh, record that. That would be a bit more manual work, but also less delay if you really want it instantly be able to send it in. Um, if you're doing APCs in the wild, like I can't really tell you what will be easiest for you, but I don't know, maybe you can get reports for publishers, but if you can't get that, like, because the transaction don't really pass directly through you, maybe you'll have to look at which your finance departments, if they can do a report of uh, APC fees claimed back uh, for APCs paid in the wild. So that's something you might have to investigate where you can find that data. Um, so what I'm going to show is the data workflow I'm using, which applies to when you can get the data from the publishers. Um, so the base in the nutshell, all it is, is finding some sort of report format from publishers and then kind of translating it into the open APC format. So here it's called manuscript DUI on the publisher board, and that needs to go in the DUI column then in the open APC. Um, so some different types of publisher data sources, uh, a very convenient one is when they can set up automatic email reports. Uh, if they have rights link, they should be able to do that. And then you get an email with uh, reports every month. Um, sometimes they don't have that. And then you might have to go into dashboard that the publisher has and export it, which you can do at any time, but it's a bit more manual. Um, and sometimes the publisher don't have these things. And then that case will have to wait for their annual reports, which we have agreed with them. Um, and if you're like doing APCs in a while, maybe you can check with publisher if they can like request, if you can request and say, oh, could you send us a list of the ones with our uh, authors from our institution and might be able to do that. Uh, well, you can probably <laughs> help out and say, if you've ever tried that, if that worked or not. Uh, one thing to, two things to keep in mind. One is, well, it can be like, uh, some, can be quite late if you're requesting like a yearly thing. I'm still, I haven't got everything from 2023 from our publishers, but also please keep in mind that it can be a bit prone to errors from the publishers. Uh, Cause if they have to put this together manually, they make a lot of errors. So you really have to check <laughs> to see, does it make sense? Um, so, um, just if you, especially if you have multiple different publishers or agreements that you're working with, you definitely want to keep track of it in some way. I have a big spreadsheet for myself to keep track of everything. So just to give you some little views sewn in on two line rows here on it. So I keep track of like, is there a problem with this at the moment or is that okay? Uh, when did the last batch end? So I know what, where the data starts that I need to take the next time. And I keep track of the frequency if it's like automatic emails I get. So I know, oh, okay, by now I should be expecting the next uh, report to come in. So you can see the first line here, my last batch when I took this screenshot was from 1st of January and I get that monthly. So there definitely should be some more data available there. Um, then I keep track of like, what is the data source? Because if you have one of different ones, you might forget that. And what I really recommend doing is just, I have a column where I just write like a tutorial for myself step by step. So I don't have to think about it every time I can just see, oh, step one, download it from here. Step two, do the, apply these filters. So I can do that without like making a mistake because I know this is the process I need to do. And it's a lot faster then as well. Uh, and then the important thing here is also to keep track of the data format because uh, you have to make sure, because the, there's a specific format to send into uh, OpenAPC, which has these columns that you need to fill out. And then you need to kind of keep track of, well, in the publisher reports, they might call it something different. 
So institution, in one of them it's called profile matched, in another one it's called derived institution. So again, making it very easy for myself, so I can just go here, oh, this is the column I need to copy over, so I don't have to try to interpret it every single time. Um, so um, the difficulty is, it's good to know this, I don't want to scare you off with it, but it's better to have a heads up. Difficulties with uh, gathering the data from reports. So first of all, there's no standard values between publishers. Uh, you really need to verify what they mean for each publisher. Uh, now you only, hopefully you only need to do that once. If you get some sort of report that looks the same every time from the publisher, like the monthly right uh, links report. But for each publisher that uses right link, they, their values might not mean the same thing. So even if it looked like, oh, it's also another right link report. No, the publishers still have their own way, <laughs> even in those. Um, so I would really recommend verify even obvious values because some call, publishers, for example, call everything gold, but in the APC, open APC, um, there's a distinction. Is it fully OA or is it a hybrid? And publishers might not mark things as hybrid. Uh, so you need to look, how do you figure out? Sometimes you need to just see, have a list of journals that are hybrid that you keep track of. And the way I would verify them is like, uh, take a few of the articles, maybe a few different types of articles from the same publisher, compare, and then like go in and view, open the article and compare, okay, did the acceptance date here mean what I thought it did? Okay, now I can write that down in my sheet. So I know next time, yes, that's what it means. <laughs> um, and yeah, ambiguous column names. Uh, one thing to really watch after is the acceptance date, because sometimes it's just called acceptance date. But who accepted what? Is, the edit, is it the editorial acceptance date? Or is it the date when the author accepted the offer or when the OA provers accepted that? So yeah, uh, it seems obvious, but then when you think about it, you really need to verify that it means what you meant. And the most important thing as all is to ask the publisher, how do I know which articles from the report were actually covered by the agreement if you have an agreement? So because they might send you a report with a bunch of different articles, that doesn't mean that all the articles in the report went through the route you thought they did. Uh, for example, covered by an agreement. So usually there are some filters you need to do, like filter on a column, maybe excluding ones that were paid for authors that could have been eligible, but for some reason they also paid them themselves and so on. So make sure you know how to filter to, to view the ones you want to. Sometimes it's not enough possible to distinguish as the publisher. I know Sage has a very strange dashboard where our agreement is marked on every article, but it turned out that doesn't mean they actually went through the agreement. If you come across that situation, you just unfortunately can't use those reports because you'd be sending in correct information. Uh, so then you'll have to ask them to send a manual report to you in some way. Uh, but there are definitely benefits <laughs> once you come up with the, the, the difficulties. Uh, so first of all, you get a for your own sake, you get a closer to real time view of any agreement you have, or even APCs in the wild. You probably also it's a good idea to try to uh, keep an eye on what's going on there. Um, you also, if you have quotas for agreement, you get a better prediction because you can see, oh, we already used this much, and it's already not even half in two years. Um, instead of waiting till the end of the year or waiting till the quota is running out. Um, you also get some insight into the publisher workflow if you use the automatic reports. So that helped us spot the misunderstanding of the drawdown date, which like the, the year that it applies to. So that how it would affect when our quota ran out. Um, it also, of course, why we're here today, <laughs> Uh, it helps improve the accuracy of the Irish monitor to be able to see which articles, how many articles were actually away and how many were not. So we can get this nice view of where are we at with our transition to 100% away. So um, just to summarize that, um, this was maybe a lot of information in a short time. So watch out for lack of standardization. You really need to verify the more uh, the format and then write it down so you remember it for later and don't have to think about it next time. Um, it's very easy to submit once you have set up the workflow. So you need to think about a few things at the start, but then once you have it, it's very easy. You just follow your own steps and send them in.
Uh, and of course, there are benefits to this. <laughs> so you get a more up-to-date view of your activities and better transparency of your institution since this is open, for example, for the Irish monitor to use, but also anyone can search uh, in the open APC uh, format. Um, so finally, my recommendation would be, since it, it can seem a bit overwhelming at first, just start with one data source, like one publisher or one place you know you can get data from, and just make that a routine first. And when you have sent that a couple of times and you're like, okay, I know uh, we, there weren't any problems the last few times I sent this, uh, then move on to the next one. <laughs> So uh, yeah, thanks for listening to that. And uh, of course, if you're starting to do these things, feel free to um, ask me as well if it's something uh, that I might have done. <laughs> so I'm gonna pop out of the share thing there. Thank you very much, Hanneke. That was very, very detailed, very interesting. And now if anybody's any questions for either Julia or Annika, please, um, Put them in the chat or raise your hands. Yeah, I see Julia has dropped the link as well in the chat for how the TA data view looks. So if you want to click that and see, uh, uh, you can get uh, the same type of uh, tree map there, but for um, the T8 data instead. So there you can see uh, the view of uh, Ireland there. That might also give you an idea if you are, if you have like a local OI publishing agreement somewhere, uh, you might want to have a look at how we've named uh, the agreements there. So that might give you an idea because there is a column for the TA submission, um, where it's also you, you're kind of putting a, a name on the, I don't know if it's seen here actually, um, on the agreement, I think. And maybe one thing that I actually didn't mention while we're waiting to see if anyone has a question, uh, if you have some local agreements, also make sure you know what you're sending in, because for example, uh, Julia, maybe actually you can clarify if some things would go in which they would go. So far, we have not sent in any of the cases where um, where we just have a discount for the TA thing. We only send the ones that are fully covered by the TA. Am I right in thinking that's the case and that if we if you have a discount, you would send that to the the normal the, or the other open APC thing and write that you have a discount or where do you want that to go actually oh yeah interesting okay so but the, the data you're talking about the one with the discount it's also part of the transformative agreement hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah so would you put that but then put the cost in the euro or would you put that as in the other open APC and just we would put that uh, also in the TA data set when it's oh, okay. published under a uh, transformative agreement. Yeah, but interesting. I think, um, yeah, mm -hmm. we have, yeah, but it's true that you can like not distinguish them between the ones uh, with discounts and without discounts. Yeah, because yeah. some are fully covered. I don't know if you, because at the moment, like it said, uh, there's just a blank column for the euro. Would you mm -hmm. want yeah, us yeah. to put a zero explicitly when it's like it's fully covered? Mm. Or is that the same as not having anything? So, yeah, I think now you just yeah. don't, you just can leave it like blank and you don't. Okay, okay, yeah. Them. So mm -hmm. it's more just if there's an agreement where they're included in the discount, we could send the discount at once and put, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Doesn't look like there have any questions coming in. Um, does anybody from Open Air want to uh, say anything before we wrap up? Just to mention for the uh, RPOs and RFOs in 
Ireland, and that it would be extremely important if they register, collaborate with Open APC and register their APCs, their funded publications into Open APC, because this way they will see uh, indicators and metrics in the Irish monitor regarding the specific uh, APCs that have been funded by the institution. Because currently most of the RFOs, if not all of them, at least the, the biggest universities, uh, have not, uh, they do not have uh, any indicators in that part of the of their dashboard. Unfortunately, due to the fact that uh, we don't have the platform available, I cannot show it to you. Yeah, and just maybe one quick note. I know it's been a lot of information right now. So if there um, are questions uh, in, after the event, after the webinar, uh, please feel free to contact us. I just post our email address as well in the chat. And I've seen that uh, Andreas also put all the relevant links to our website, to our repository, also in the chat. So yeah, please feel free uh, to contact us. We are happily uh, advising you. Well, thank you, Julia and Annika, uh, for two uh, excellent presentations. And uh, I think we'll leave it there for now. And yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can follow up with, with Julia or Annika. Okay, just a brief uh, reminder. Uh, we will uh, conclude uh, uh, our uh, training series uh, uh, next uh, um, May 24. Uh, you are all in a uh, session that is about uh, open orgs and how to um, define uh, the uh, parent-child uh, relationship so between uh, the departments and we are looking forward uh, to see you again. Thank you.